how do we show, it's trivial to show that they are orthonormal. Let's do that. So you see, this is what I say when I complain about signal processing books. Everything that you do is just geometry. Everything can be said, look, Fourier series are simply a representation in an orthonormal base. And essentially, what is then, what are the CNs? Uh, so simply f of x is sum when n goes from minus infinity to fi infinity. Scalar product of f with e to the i n t times e to the i n t. So to get these coefficients, that make this equality, you simply project. You find projection on every coordinate vector, right? I.e., so what is a, a, a scalar product between f and e to the i and t? Well, this is simply integral 1 over 2 pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity, f of t, e to the minus i and t, because it's complex conjugation, dt. This is your cn for here, right? So we are not, you see, you don't have to memorize anything. No formulas need to be memorized. You only have to remember that complex exponentials form an orthonormal basis, and then you simply proceed to compute the projections, and you identify this with precisely this formula, right? So, um, what did I want to say and now forgot? Um, not one. So, this is this is why Fourier uh, series of any decent function converges <coughs> to the function simply because it's a decomposition, it's a representation of the vector f of x in an infinitely dimensional space in which, you see here, in, before we had a sum, here of course the sum becomes infinitely refined, right? When you, if you increase the number of points in discrete Fourier transform, the fundamental frequency becomes 2 pi divided by n. So smaller and smaller and smaller. Which means that the sinusoids become denser and denser and denser and eventually they become just continuous. Um, so let us now see um, what this is good for. So you can see kind of also in my lecture notes historical account about that related to vibrating stig and uh, uh, this uh, transmission of heat, heat propagation. Okay, so this gives you representation of th on things that are periodic. But in real life, most signals like for example my speech they are not periodic. So the question is, uh, what do you do? How do you uh, represent a uh, non-periodic signals, right? Well, to do that, you simply make now this time even this sum infinitely defined. Yes. Oh, sorry, I thought someone was uh, about to ask something. So to, what does it make to, mean to make this sum infinitely defined? Well, simply replace the sum with the, an integral, right? So this is how we come to the Fourier integral. Right? So um, what is the Fourier integral? So Fourier integral f hat of omega is simply the projection of your function 
onto the frequency equal omega. So it will be 1 over 2. Uh, OK, now this uh, normalization constant. Let's then do just uh, integral from minus pi. Ah, sorry, from minus infinity to infinity. Ah. Uh, f of t times uh, e to the minus i omega t dt. So what is the scalar product here? So here, scalar product of f and t and g, so non-periodic function, functions, uh, is defined as integral from minus infinity to infinity f of t g of t conjugate dt. So what is, what is actually this scalar product? It's point-wise product of functions averaged over time. Right? So if we take this, then what we wrote here is simply that f hat of omega is the scalar product of f and e to the i omega t. Well, if this is the case, if it's scalar product to this of this, uh, then you should expect to have the reconstruction just as in the discrete case, namely f of t <coughs> should be now equal. And okay, now this uh, annoying one over two pi comes from the fact that I didn't put two pi in the exponent. Uh, and uh, electrical engineers prefer not to put the exponent, even though if you put the exponent, these normalization factors disappear. But uh, let's keep it uh, as it's in signal processing book. So essentially, f of t is back integral of uh, uh, f e to the i omega t, right, um, times e to the i omega t the omega, right? So this integrates, so this is the projection, but it's projection on, in on uncountably many sine waves. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a projection, so which is, of course, just a shorthand for uh, this. Uh, uh, we called this f hat of omega. Right? Here it is. So we get the formula integral from minus infinity to infinity f hat of omega e to the i omega t dt. So this is now putting back. So this does analysis. This finds the coefficients. And then inverse Fourier transform turns back the coefficients for each harmonic back into the original function. Isn't so it's a straight out. Isn't the range minus pi of pi? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. This is the range is minus. Well, OK. Now, this requires a little bit of explanation. This actually works. Uh, uh, regardless of what f is, uh, uh, but there is a special class of functions. So this is the formula actually works for whenever both of these functions are L2 integrable. If, uh, so this works if both f hat of omega integral of this squared d omega and integral of f of t square dt if both of them are smaller than infinity. Now, a special of special interest in engineering are the functions where this guy has one important property. What is this guy? This guy tells you the projection of your signal to this harmonic. 
So it tells you how much amplitude this harmonic has. The most important functions in engineering have such a projection non equal to zero only within a bounded range. For example, for sound, I cannot hear anything past 20 kilohertz. So for all practical purposes, I can assume that the bandwidth of sound is from 0 to 20 kilohertz. And outside of that, it's equal to 0. Simply because I cannot hear it, I can concentrate only on the part. So theoretically, the sound spreads on infinitely many frequencies. But uh, because um, also when you do radio transmission, um, our oscillators can oscillate only up to certain bandwidth. So for, for engineering, so most important case, are uh, uh, band-limited functions are actually, let's call them signals. So, of finite energy uh, they usually they are denoted as VL uh, phi uh, or um, uh, PW phi like this PW stands for Paley Wiener uh, who uh, studied them uh, extensively for the first time what are the such signals? They are the signals such that f hat of omega is zero when omega is by absolute value smaller than a band limit b. Now, if you choose the time measuring interval carefully, Sorry? Greater. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. When this is greater than B, thank you. So if you use, if you choose measuring time interval carefully, you can always renormalize things so that B becomes equal to pi. Because all the formulas. And then we have what uh, you suggested, the formula that says for such signals, f of t is in fact over, always equal 1 over 2 pi, integral from minus pi to pi, f hat of omega, e to the i omega t, d omega. So what is this f hat of omega? Its absolute value tells you how much of this particular frequency is present in the, say, sound. Its argument just shifts the sinusoids left and right a little bit, uh, right? Uh, but it's nothing but generalization of the Fourier series when sums are replaced by integrals and your frequencies, bins, get kind of infinitely far. Now, these guys that have this property have another fundamental property that allows your uh, compact disc player to work. Namely, the fundamental theorem here that is unjustly called Shannon sampling formula. He just popularized it, but the formula was uh, uh, discovered way before Shannon in early 20th century by several people, by Whittaker, uh, then Russian guy Kotelnikov, and uh, 
let's see, Sharon Vitaker, Kotelnikov, and someone else that I unfortunately forget. But it says this. Every f that belongs to PL pi, so any function whose Fourier transform is zero outside of pi, when p is equal to pi, is uniquely determined by its samples at integers. I, if I know, if I know infinitely many samples So if I know what the following are, uh, so if you have, a, say, a sound wave, and I sample it at integers, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, and so forth. So I know what, and of course also in the negative direction, f minus k dot 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 f at minus 1, f at 0, f at 1, f at uh, k dot dot dot. So if I probe the values, if I have uh, some device, uh, <coughs> which is of course called analog to digital converter, that every so often in uniform pulses, takes the measurement. <coughs> How often do I have to take the measurements? Well, let's see. If I have integers um, 0, 1, 2, and my band limit is pi, right? then sine of uh, pi t is, uh, will be 0 uh, at uh, integers. So it means that I have to sample twice the frequency of the highest component, right? Um, so if the band limit is 20 kilohertz, I have to sample at least 40,000 times a second. And of course, in practice, <coughs> for practical reasons to avoid something called aliasing, we sample at a higher rate of uh, how much? What's the rate for uh, CD players? 44. 44.1, exactly. So about 10% higher than what's absolutely necessary. Okay. Now, why is this? Uh, this allows CDs to work. Because you cannot store continuous time signal. But you can, in fact, store the outputs of your analog to digital converter. <coughs> Excuse me. So then this theorem not only says that there is a unique <coughs> sound, but it actually gives you the way to reconstruct it. OK? <coughs> now. Why would this be true? <coughs> well, this is true because of what? What do you think? It is true because of this. The content of the theorem, this theorem here, is uh, this picture. And nothing more. Let's see it. OK. Since uh, we assumed uh, 
that f hat of omega is equal zero for absolute value of omega bigger than pi, we can extend uh, f hat of omega periodically, right? So if this is, uh, well, now you see, this is, this is a complex valued function, but I draw it into the, what can I do, right? Uh, it should be a, a real and imaginary component, but uh, you can just say we plot a real part, then it should look like this, and then I can simply extend it periodically, or simply I can say any function between minus pi and pi is representable by Fourier series, right? Because we just saw that Fourier series, in fact, form an orthonormal basis. So f hat of omega, right, can be represented as sum n equals from minus infinity to infinity, projection of f hat of omega to the harmonic e to the i n um, omega, right, uh, times e to the i n omega, right? What is this? This is simply the projection, right? So this is because uh, e to the i n omega are an orthonormal basis for functions on minus pi pi, right? So if you take the Fourier transform of the signal, it is bounded between minus pi and pi. But anything that lives between minus pi and pi can be represented as Fourier series. So what do we get from that? Let's see. Let's compute what this is equal to. So notice, all what we are doing, we are just going in around and around and around this picture and just computing things given what is the notion of projection, what is the scalar product. But no other concept has entered the, the picture at all, whatsoever. It's just this. In an orthonormal basis, any vector is linear combination of the basis vectors weighted by the projection on that vector. So what does this mean? Well, let's compute this. So we have f hat of, okay, so let's compute it. Uh, so we want to compute the scalar product of this and e to the i omega uh, I, uh, sorry, I n omega. Well, this product is 1 over 2 pi, right? Integral between minus pi to pi of f hat of omega. I have to complex conjugate this, e to the minus I n omega the omega. But what is this? The inverse. That's exactly the inverse Fourier transform. We know the following, that f of t by inverse formula is 1 over 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi f hat of omega e to the i omega t d 
d omega. So if I take this and put, I write it as follows, 1 over 2 pi, integral from minus pi to pi, f hat of omega, e to the i times minus n times omega d omega. What is this? Uh, what do I have to substitute here for t? Minus n. Minus n. So this implies that f of minus n is precisely f hat of omega e to the i omega uh, i n omega. So notice this means that my Fourier transform f hat of omega has been written in the following <coughs> manner. f at minus n e to the i n omega, right? So here is an amazing fact about bound limited functions. If you represent their Fourier transform by series, the coefficients are the samples of the signal. Right? So the coefficients are the samples of the signal. Right? So what have we used so far? Nothing. We used only this picture and the definition of a scalar product. The rest came out by itself. This is why you cannot forget these things or, you know, simply because you remember only the picture and definition of scalar product. And you simply compute. Everything else is simply comes from there automatically. Okay, so now what we can do, we can substitute this in the definition of the Fourier transform. Let's do that. You see, this is, there is, there is, you see, the content here is just geometry and nothing else. There are no formulas. The formulas are just shorthand, right? So what do we know? We know that f of t is equal to 1 over 2 pi, integral between minus pi and pi, f hat of omega e to the i omega t, d omega. Let's replace this by its Fourier series. So this is equal to 1 over 2 pi, integral from minus pi to pi, sum n equals from minus infinity to infinity, f at minus n e to the i n omega, right? Um, times, uh, uh, so this whole thing, right, that's my f hat, right, this is just f hat of omega represented as Fourier series, times e to the i omega t d omega. So what do you think, what am I going to do now here? When you have an integral of a sum, you want to exchange. You want to exchange. Mathematicians would like me to prove uniform convergence and things like that. We are engineers. We just do stuff and hope for the best. Okay? So uh, we get that this is equal to 1 over 2 pi. Okay, I'll write it like this. Uh, sum n equals from minus infinity to infinity, right? And then I have f at minus n, right? And then I have e to the i uh, omega uh, t plus n. Uh, let me see, am I missing something? Your integral I, side. Ah, yeah, integral side from minus pi to pi, 
e to the i n omega t and just here d omega, right? Now this is awkward with this minus here, so I'll introduce minus n is equal to a new summation variable k, right? Since this goes from minus infinity to infinity, k will also go from minus infinity to infinity, just in the opposite uh, order, but that's the same at the sum. So this is then sum, let me be super pedantic and write k equals from minus infinity to infinity, f at k, e to the i omega, and here I'll have t minus k d omega, and uh, here is the integral from minus pi to pi, and darn, I forgot, 1 over 2 pi, sorry, uh, 1 over 2 pi, f of k minus 1 over 2 pi. But this you can explicitly integrate, just exponential function, so this will be equal to sum n is equal from minus infinity, or k equals from minus infinity to infinity, f of k, and uh, times, what is this integral? Well, this integral is e to the i omega t minus k divided by i, uh, i, uh, let's see, we are integrating with respect to omega, so uh, uh, free thing is t minus k, uh, right? Evaluated from minus pi to pi, uh, divided by, multiplied by one over two pi, right? So what happens? <coughs> Imaginary parts cancel out, right? Because sine and minus pi is minus sine at pi, right? So this will be then equal sum, k equals from minus infinity to infinity of, uh, sorry, uh, because of i here, actually, uh, okay, let me then do it honest to God. So this will be, uh, it will be cosine uh, pi d minus K, right, plus i sine pi t minus k minus cosine minus pi uh, t minus k plus i sine minus pi t minus k and then the whole thing right, has to be divided by i times uh, 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 2 pi, uh, okay, so let me put it here, 1 over 2 pi, right, so now what happens, this cancels this, because these two are equal, but you have minus sign here, and this minus sign goes out and turns this into plus, so you get that this sum is equal to uh, two times, so you will get this is equal to, and here we have f as k. So equals, so we will have one over two pi, well, let me write it sum, k equals from minus infinity to infinity, f of k times one over two pi, times two times sine pi t minus k divided by um, uh, by what? By uh, t minus k, right? Because i's cancel on top and the bottom, right? Uh, this uh, divided by i times t minus k, right? This will cancel this i and you get only this, and then this and this cancels out, and you get that this is sum, k equals from minus infinity to infinity, f of k, 
This function pi becomes here has a name and it's called sin. Sometimes it includes pi, sometimes it doesn't. Let me use it like this. Uh, electrical engineers usually include pi here, so you wouldn't write it. And this is the famous Shannon reconstruction formula. It allows you to tell what's the value of your function, right? This is your f of t. In any point in between samples using this interpolation. Right? And how did we get it? Uh, you see, it's very simple. It's a band-limited function. Fourier transform lives between minus pi to pi. Expand it in Fourier series. And it turns out the coefficients are just samples of the uh, signal at integers. Replace it in the Fourier transform. You integrate, and things pop up. The, this function comes just from the integral. So all what we did is use definition of scalar product, definition of Fourier integral, and the little picture. And that's it, right? So that's the famous uh, Shannon sampling formula. And things actually are even stronger than that in the following sense. Signals live in two separate spaces uh, that are isometric. What are the spaces? The spaces are in the frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, we represent things as linear combinations of uh, complex exponentials. Uh, right? In the time domain f of t, signals live uh, as linear combinations of the sync functions. And things are isometric, isometric in the sense that norm of this function is equal to the norm computed here. Scalar product of two functions here is equal to scalar product of their time domain representation. So it's a complete isometry. And a good part of signal processing is just going back and forth between these two domains because some things are easier done in the frequency domain. Some things are easier done 